Well, there's JC. Coming. Dennis? Yes? You're going to talk about the new nasal and sublingual preparations yes. on the mark. Yeah, good. Okay. I'm going to bring that up. But good, our good. group doing the research. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've done all the research on the intranasal. No, I was going to bring it up. Should mention that we've done that research, you know. Yep. One, two. Dr. Lockie, you can get started anytime you're ready. Are you ready? Jennifer, yes. am I on? Yep, you're on. Hi, hi everybody. I'm Richard Lockie. I'm director of the Division of Allergy, Immunology, and the Department of Internal Medicine. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our lecture today. Uh, before doing so, here's a book that has recently been published on the subject he's going to talk about. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sarun Ledford and Lockyer, the editors, allergic and non-allergic systemic reactions, including anaphylaxis. Dr. Ledford is internationally recognized in his field of allergy immunology. He's a past president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He served on the American Board of Allergy Immunology. He's a who's who in our specialty, and he's a who, who who's who in, in this subject. This subject is an extraordinarily important subject for each one of you. I can't tell you how important it is, because if you have anaphylaxis with a patient for any reason, and the patient doesn't do well, doesn't survive, or ends up with any kind of sequelae, it's going to end up in court. That's an absolute guarantee. Dr. Ledford and I have been around for 30, 40 years, and we can testify to that over and over again. So if there's one subject you have to know about if you're giving any kind of oral medications, IV medications, or IV medications about how to treat systemic allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. It's not only important for the patient, because the patient either survives it or doesn't survive it. Sometimes there's sequelae, or the patient dies, and then there's all sorts of consequences from that. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ledford, take over. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this lecture. And pay attention, everybody, because it, it, it affects all of your practices and all of your lives. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, Dick, I appreciate it. Uh, it gives me more credit than I deserve, but I am happy to uh, be with you and do this. So uh, let's get involved here. All right. Hopefully I'm navigating this properly. Jennifer, do we see the slides? Yes, they look good. All right, look better than I do. Okay, uh, we are gonna talk about anaphylaxis and I wanna make this interactive as possible. It's very difficult in this kind of venue, these virtual sessions, uh, I'd much rather be face to face, but I did ask that um, you submit questions in the chat. Jennifer will be monitoring it and she will interrupt me if you have questions as we go through this. Because, you know, if you get slides in a speaker, they'll fill up whatever time they have with talking and talking. So interrupt me. But I, I'd like to leave leave the thought with you after we spend our little time together about anaphylaxis, because I do agree, as the Dr. Lucky said, how important it is for all of us as physicians to recognize this. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges. But anaphylaxis, I feel the treatment is very much like good comedy. I think we all know very smart people who cannot tell a good joke. And and part of the reason is the punchline timing has to be right. And with anaphylaxis, the epinephrine timing has to be right for everything to work well. And I don't think you should get balled up so much in, in worrying about terms and definitions and triptases as, as in telling a good joke because timing is everything. So we're going to review a case of, of, of immediate symptoms and discuss if this meets, quote, a definition of anaphylaxis. I'm going to try to touch on the epidemiology of anaphylaxis, but I, I, I want to harp again and again on the fact that if we can't agree on the definition, it makes it very difficult to do epidemiology. And by the way, there's no evidence-based medicine to speak of because ethically you can't really do double-blind randomized controlled trials of an event that occurs sporadically and has potentially life-threatening consequences. We'll talk about causes, but I want to particularly emphasize causes that we do as doctors and our role in response to those causes, because we can't 
affect things such as an insect stinging someone nearly as much as what happens when we give a drug to someone. I do want to spend some time on triptase. I think this is a very testable area for boards. And it also comes up in the interpretation of lab tests. And I think we should be aware of this and touch a little bit on the mast cell disorders because they are related to this. And then, of course, talk about treatment. I do have some potential conflicts or pot competing interests. I don't think they're relevant to this. I will point out that our clinical research center uh, that Dr. Locke uh, started and is now run by Tom Casale and Amber Pepper has been very involved in looking at innovative ways of giving epinephrine, particularly nasal epinephrine, which will probably be uh, approved sometime this year, and uh, a sublingual epinephrine that can be used to try to overcome some of the problems pa people have in giving epinephrine, the patients, for fear of using a needle. And I think we doctors have a fear of it too. And I, again, want to emphasize the importance of not worrying so much about side effects, but emphasizing the importance of the of timing of the epinephrine is important. Uh, I'll also mention, I am a member of the Practice Parameters Task Force, and I've gotten permission to use some of the slides from the new practice parameter that will be published this year, even though they're not yet available for public use or viewing. So the case I'm gonna give you is why allergists, uh, why we as allergists, I think, are, are, are so uh, accustomed to talking about anaphylaxis. Part of it's because we, quote, own the mast cell, but you could argue hematologist owns mast cells as much as allergists. But every day in clinic, we give allergic people, many of whom have asthma, injections with things they're allergic to. And if, you're, if you want a perfect storm for having anaphylaxis, that's it. And so this 37-year-old white female is an allergic person. She's getting allergy injections. She's atopic. She makes IgE. She has nasal symptoms, and she has a little bit of asthma. And she received a maintenance dose of an allergy injection. So this is a material made up of, of extracts of substances such as pollen and animal products, dust mites, for example, or, or cat. She's getting a liquid injection of this, and she's been on the same dose for several years. So it's not like the first time she's received it. Now she receives it usually once every three or four weeks, so there's an inter interval. So there's another message, something that she's had over and over, and this happens. So she gets this allergy injection and she describes within 10 minutes feeling warm and a little bit of itching and maybe some nausea. You check her vital signs uh, or your, your staff provide the vital signs to you. Uh, pulse is 88, so she doesn't have a tachycardia. Six, respiration 16, maybe a tad bit elevated. Blood pressure, she's 37. Probably it's okay because her pulse is 88. She has no rash. Her skin is clear. You listen to her. You, you interview her. Her chest is, has no wheeze, and she has a little bit of asthma. So the question would be posed, is this anaphylaxis? And what would you do at this point? Would you just reassure her? Tell her to relax, don't worry, we've got this covered. Maybe give her some oral antihistamine, our favorite, like diphenhydramine or maybe cetirizine. Have her walk around and cool off because she feels warm. Give her epinephrine and tell her to lay down because you're afraid she, something bad's gonna happen. Or would you start uh, oral antihistamine and start an IV and give IV solumedrol? Well, this gets back to the purpose of the definition. What, why, do we, why do we talk about anaphylaxis and the definition so much, it's because we don't have one. We, there, there's lots of them. Uh, I'm not saying they're not worthy of discussion because we're going to talk about them. But the problem is, is we can't agree on exactly what to call anaphylaxis. Uh, and so because of that, when you look at epidemiology or treatment outcomes or any other parameter you want to look at, it's difficult to interpret the literature because you can't always tell how, the, how they defined anaphylaxis in the study. But definitions are critical. They improve communication. I can't tell another doctor or another health professional that someone has anaphylaxis if we don't both understand the common term and what we're saying. It also is critical for epidemiology. You can't study prevalence and incidence if you can't agree on the definition. But I think very importantly, it facilitates clinical decision making. And the, the definition you use in clinic on the, in the hospital may not actually be the same definition you choose to use in epidemiologic studies because timing is everything and you may choose to want to use a definition that's more real-time based, 
not waiting for severe outcomes before you want to label it anaphylaxis because you want to treat it because timing is everything. So let's look at some of the, the definitions. Usually you'll see one of these terms or more, uh, many of these terms in a definition. Uh, sometimes it will say allergic, sometimes it will say allergic or non-allergic. You'll often see the word life-threatening, multi-system comes up or systemic over and over. Sometimes you'll see the word hypersensitivity, sometimes it'll refer to mast cells or basophils. So this is the practice parameter that will be coming out, uh, and I'm buried down there and one of the, was one of the authors. The, 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 the effort is led by David Golden, who's a recognized expert in hymenoptera, venom hypersensitivity from, from Johns Hopkins, who was co-chair of the, of the uh, practice parameter and uh, of the committee, but he's also the writing co-chair, and Julie Wang. Um, so the definition that we, after debate and, and some discussion, we d agreed on this. The, the, the right-hand side shows you what the, the NI, uh, NIAID definition, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease definition that was developed with a combination of the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network. And Hugh Sampson, um, who um, led this effort, uh, some well-known in the food allergy community, to come up with a definition. And the definition was, and if you can see it, number one is having at least one of the following. I'm sorry, having a skin rash and at least one of the following. Sudden respiratory symptoms or a, a cardiovascular collapse. So that to have anaphylaxis, you had to have skin symptoms or one of these other two things. This was if you were had no, oops, if you didn't know what you're exposed to. Uh, and number two is if you have an exposure to a suspected allergen, such as a food ingestion, and now you can see GI symptoms are added. And in number three, reduced blood pressure after exposure to a known allergen. So if you go back to our patient, we knew she's allergic to what we gave her, so she was getting a known allergen. By this definition, I would not use the label anaphylaxis until her blood pressure was reduced. And that, as you can see, it's a 30% reduction uh, or a system a systolic pressure less than 90. So I think the point of this is there are criteria you can use, but the anaphylaxis is potentially life-threatening. And so what you'd like to do is intervene before it is life-threatening. And that's where the timing issue comes up. And diagnostic criteria are not perfect. And the use of epinephrine does not require that you meet all the definition criteria, meaning I can't use epinephrine until I want to label this as anaphylaxis. If you feel like you can't label as anaphylaxis because it doesn't meet the criteria, then call it a systemic reaction, but still treat it with epinephrine because timing is everything. And I, I don't think we should wait for shock or respiratory distress. That's the two way people die. They die in shock or respiratory distress. Shock is due to vascular leakage or third space fluid loss and vasodilation, followed by cardio repression, repressive factors. Respiratory problems are due to edema, angioedema, which is third space fluid loss in the soft tissues of the larynx, or bronchospasm. And that's one of the reasons asthmatics are prone to more severe anaphylaxis, is they tend to be the ones that get the bronchospasm. That's the way people die. You don't die from vomiting or diarrhea or itching. You die from cardiovascular collapse or respiratory compromise, which will either be angioedema of the larynx or bronchospasm. You can see the lifetime prevalence is 1.6 to 5%. Now keep in mind, if you don't agree on the definition, you're probably not gonna be able to actually get lifetime prevalence. Here's, here's one of the physiologic reasons if you look at cardiovascular collapse as to why timing is everything. If you look at the onset of decrease in blood pressure, let's say our patient's blood pressure was decreasing and we measured it, she didn't have a tachycardia, but we measured it, in the early onset of, of, of her decrease in pressure, it says shock here, but let's just say onset of her hypertension, systemic vascular resistance goes down. And after the first few minutes of this reaction, it's, it is still down. But as it, as, as, it, as it progresses, systemic vascular resistance increases. If you give epinephrine during that early phase, it's extremely effective because it vasoconstricts at the time when vasodilation is occurring and before third space loss occurs, because you can see central venous pressure drops in the, in the second phase. I can't touch this thing without it moving. So uh, in the second column, 
the CVP goes down, that's when the third space loss is beginning to be a, a major problem. Once that gets beyond uh, too far gone, vasoconstriction isn't going to help you because you already have increased vascular resistance and giving epinephrine now is going to actually increase adverse events and not help the patient. It's going to increase VTAC or ventricular tachycardia, but it's not going to help because their third space loss is so severe that you can't correct their hypotension with epinephrine. If you'd given it early though, it would have worked. And the reason we don't die from anaphylaxis, the mortality is, is really low that we'll talk about in just a moment, even though we talk about it, is potentially life-threatening. It, it's a potential cause of fatality. Every time you give someone a drug, this is a potential outcome. But our bodies compensate, and they compensate primarily through epinephrine and angiotensin production. But how many of your patients are on a beta blocker, an, an ARB, or an ACE inhibitor? All of those are going to hamstring the physiologic response to the hypotension. So if we do focus on severity, Mortality is probably in the range of 0.1%. I think the 2% is, is high, but you will see this range. And in surgery, it's up to 6 to 8%. Well, why, why is that? Why is there such variability in mortality? It's because like our patient, there's other factors that influence the severity. Remember, she'd gotten the allergy injection before and never had a reaction to it. Why, why now? And so the factors that affect severity include rapid onset of symptoms after trigger, meaning if my patient got the injection, let's say a drug on the floor or in any ICU or wherever the patient might be, a biologic in your clinic, and the symptoms start soon after the injection, that's a warning sign of more, more severe reaction. Injected antigens or allergens are more problematic. So when you give injections of a biologic or a drug, much greater chance than if you give it orally. Deaths from oral penicillin are probably less than two in the world's literature. All the deaths have occurred from injections, mainly IM, but also IV. The third is delay and utilization of epinephrine. And the reason I have that bolded is that is the one thing that you have control over after this thing starts. You can't affect the fact the, fact the patient has asthma. You should have thought of that beforehand, but at this point, you can't do much about that. You can't affect the fact that your patient's older or has heart disease. You can't affect the dose because the dose has already been given. You don't know if they have a mast cell disorder. They may be on a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, an R, but you, that's, you can't change that now. The only thing you can change is the punchline. How quickly did you give epinephrine? If you look at registries, you have the same problem. The Europeans are very good at this because they have, syst they have socialized or uh, nationalized health systems, so they can collect data in much larger um, networks but you still have to struggle with the definition. And when you have referral centers, you always wonder, are they gonna get referrals in only the most severe cases? And here you can see 40% of all these in this European registry were deemed to be severe and 0.5% were refractory, very difficult to treat. So what was associated with severity and refractoriness was drugs, particularly perioperative. Again, that brings up perioperative anaphylaxis is a much bigger risk factor for mortality, probably 10 times or well, five to 10 times more mortality risk than there is general anaphylaxis. Honeybee stings are more of risk than fiery ants or yellow jackets or wasps. Food in children, particularly milk and egg in very young children, but nuts. And in adults, it's gonna be peanut, fish and shellfish, uh, and maybe cashew primarily. And keeping in mind in children, repetitive vomiting can be a manifestation of persistent anaphylaxis. If you look at fatalities in the Australian database that was over eight years and included 20 million people, they, only, they had 112 fatalities. And you can see the breakdown again, drug and probable drug was 50%. The things you as a doctor control. Now, sometimes these drugs are over the counter, I understand, but notice the other things are gonna be food and insects and then indeterminate. But in allergy clinic, we're giving allergy injections every day. So for us, that's our biggest concern because that's more common for us than a drug because we're giving allergy injections. This is a, a paper that was, was published in 2013, but I think it brings up a very important point that we obsess about fatality because it scares the be bejesus out of us and, and it certainly scares me when I, when I hear the word anaphylaxis. But I think it's important to give some context to this because I think the public thinks that if I have a food allergy, I'm gonna die. 
And if you look up at the top, you can see annual incidence rate for different events in food allergic people. And then you can see, and uh, this is all age groups. And you can see fatal food anaphylaxis is somewhere around maybe uh, not one in 900,000 to one in, one in a million. And you can see deaths due to lightning is about, uh, you can see over is about one in every nine million. Well, we live in the lightning strike capital, one of the lightning strike capitals of the world. There's still some debate about it. Actually, Texas, Kansas, and I think uh, Oklahoma have more lightning, ground lightning strikes in Florida, but we have a greater population density. So we have more lightning strike deaths in Florida than anywhere in the country. And you can, and that in Florida might be in the range of, of maybe one for every two million, because it's one in nine million is for the is for the country uh, deaths due to lightning, and and so food that the chance of you dying from food anaphylaxis is about the same as dying of a lightning strike in Tampa. And contrast that to things that go on every day, such as automobile accidents, which you can see is like one in in five thousand. Um, and you can see deaths to murder in the U.S. at least is one in twelve thousand. So we we worry about this because why we as physicians control a lot of things, including the timing of epinephrine. But the reality is, it isn't as risky as you probably you might think. So although I'm trying to say that there is, we have physiologic protection in our bodies to help us not die from anaphylaxis. But your responsible as, as responsibility as a doctor is to make sure you do everything possible to ensure that your patient does okay. To further confuse the definition, you have different mechanisms. So you have immunologic, non-immunologic, and this big bugaboo, idiopathic, which I like to say is your doctor's an idiot and I feel pathetic that I came to see you. Is that the best you can come up with? Um, so some people like the word spontaneous rather than idiopathic because it sounds like they know more. So you could have idiopathic urticaria or spontaneous urticaria, but the bottom line is we still don't know why you have urticaria. But you can see that it can be both immunologic and non-immunologic. And most of the time we think of this as a mast cell thing. It, it, this is due to mast cell degranulation through IgE, for example, on the, on the mast cell. And that's, that's true. But I will say that there's fairly good evidence through animal work primarily, but also some human work, that other cells, including macrophages and platelets, may affect anaphylaxis. And so it might be possible for you to have anaphylaxis and it not even be due to a mast cell event. But in general, we associate mast cell events with anaphylaxis because of the mediators in mast cells. But I will point out that mast cells do a lot more than bind to IgE. They have other receptors on their, on their surface. Things like MGRPX2 receptor, mass-related G-coupled protein receptor X2, which happens to bind vancomycin and, and quinolone antibiotics. And if you have a lot of those receptors on the surface of your mast cell, you could bind that antibiotic and having never been seen it, having no IgE to it. And when we talk about testing, can you test my patient to see if they're allergic to drug X? Basically, our tests are IgE dependent. Well, if you have a T cell dependent mechanism, if you have a macrophage dependent mechanism, if you have a platelet dependent mechanism, we can't test you. We can only challenge you. And that's really the way that we have to confirm drug sensitivity if we can't do IgE type testing. If we look for causes that are IgE dependent, they're, they're basically these five. Um, they're foods, uh, and I will emphasize galactose alpha 13 galactose because that's a sugar that's in red mammalian non-primate meat. This is in cows and sheep and pigs, but not in, in fish or turkeys or humans. And this sugar can cause anaphylaxis but it's peculiar because it causes delayed anaphylaxis four to five hours after ingestion. And it typically only occurs or is often occurs when you have cofactors. Remember our patient had gotten allergy injections for two years and didn't have any reaction. What are these cofactors? Well, the cofactors are things like alcohol, uh, dehydration, uh, fatigue, exercise, menstrual cycle, so there's a lot of factors that influence how our bodies respond to things beyond the IgE level or whether you've had it before. So someone could eat peanuts and maybe have a mild reaction and then eat peanuts and have a severe reaction because these cofactors change. 
But alpha, galactose alpha 1, 3D galactose typically occurs in people who have a large ingestion of red meat, often associated with alcohol, and, and often it's a fatty meal. That may have something to do with the absorption of this substance and why it react. But other times they can have a hamburger but, and not even have any reaction. So again, it's, it's tricky. So food, is, and, and that's going to be peanut, tree nut, fish, shellfish, and seeds. Those are the ones you need to think of. Peanut, tree nut, fish, shellfish, and seeds. Keep the seeds in mind. Um, people don't think about eating seeds. They don't know what a chia seed is. They don't know about poppy seeds. They don't think about sesame seeds. Always keep that in mind. Remember the galactose alpha-1,3. That's going to be someone with delayed food anaphylaxis after red meat, typically at 1 or 2 in the morning after watching the football game, having three beers and a big steak. Medications, medications, medications. So you as a doctor give medications, that's where the cause is going to come that you caused. And antibiotics are the number one. If you're in the OR, it's the paralytics uh, and the protamine and chlorhexidine. Uh, venom is a stings, and we talked about that. Honeybee is the most severe as far as causing uh, fatality, but they're the most docile insects and sting the least. Latex is diminishing in prevalence as we don't use it as much in the in in uh, clinical settings. And then for us as allergists, it's allergy vaccines. That's probably our number one uh, cause. Non-IgE medicine. Remember, we say it could be immunologic or non-immunologic. So these are mechanisms in which we don't know that there's a specific immune mechanism, but it does still seem that mast cells degranulate. And this could include, again, muscle paralytics, which is, you, you may remember from the previous slide, muscle paralytics are on, on a, can cause IgE-mediated. They can also cause non-IgE-mediated degranulation of mast cells, maybe through the MRG PRX2. NSAIDs. NSAIDs are a, a predisposing factor. I don't think I mentioned that. I said alcohol, menstrual cycle, stress, dehydration, exercise. NSAIDs change your threshold for anaphylaxis. So maybe if you had ibuprofen in the food, it's, it's going to potentially make it more likely to occur. Exercise, reasons we don't understand. And there, we have some, some syndromes where you eat certain foods and exercise, you get anaphylaxis. If you exercise without the food or eat the food without exercise, you don't have anaphylaxis. And there you have the oh, idiopathic again showing up. Um, there are some syndromes. We've already alluded to the idiopathic. We're going to talk about mast cell activation because that's an important concept. Um, it's very testable. It gets into the mast cell um, evaluation and, and tryptase understanding. Exercise induced, we've already talked about. Food dependent exercise tends to be some peculiar foods like, well, shrimp is not that peculiar, I guess, but celery and wheat aren't typically foods we think about causing anaphylaxis. Anasacus is a parasite that would be in fish that's undercooked or not or raw. So sushi lovers, uh, be aware of this is a parasite in which someone has IgE to the parasite. But if they tested you to the fish, it would be negative. Galactose, alpha-1, 3-D galactose, we've already mentioned. Uh, the sensitivity for this probably comes from, from amblyoma americana or the lone star tick bites, which have this uh, polysaccharide in their saliva. So people that live in the south have a much higher level of this antibody than people that live elsewhere. And this was first brought to attention because of anaphylaxis from cetuximab, which is a monoclonal antibody that blocks um, epithelial growth factor, I believe. And anaphylaxis was occurring in the clinical trials in the South, but not in the Northeast. And so they said, those people in the South don't know what they're doing, I don't know what's going on. And it turned out, it seemed that if you were having tick bites with amblyoma americana, you were more likely to be sensitized to this alpha 1,3-D galactose, and it was causing cetuximab. And then later, that was found to be associated with the delayed red meat anaphylaxis. With cetuximab, it wasn't delayed, it was immediate. Remember, that was injected, it was an IV infusion. Not, you're not eating it with drinking beer. And then hidden food allergens are also something to keep in mind. Things on the rise is chlorhexidine, this, this topical that we use, and it's often coating uh, catheters, such as Foley catheters, uh, is it, an increasing reported. We've already mentioned the alpha galactose issue. Gelatin uh, is, is in a lot of products and, and is, is derived from animals and can cause reactions. We remember the polyethylene glycol polysorbate issue around the um, COVID vaccine. Uh, we're seeing more, we're having more information about mast cell issues that are associated with anaphylaxis we're going to talk about. And on the decline, as far as clinical activity, is insect allergy and latex. Anaphylaxis in the community um, is usually going to be a food. It doesn't cause, it doesn't come from casual skin contact or inhalation. It's going to be food. Uh, you typically want the, the epinephrine given in the lateral thighs you see here. If you're wearing jeans, though, as in this picture, the needle may not be long enough. 
and so that can be a concern. Um, you want to you want to make sure that they uh, understand about use of epinephrine. That timing is everything. But I tell you, patients are hesitant to do it. They think, well, I should hold on and wait and wait and wait, or maybe I should take some Benadryl and wait and wait, or have a glass of wine and some Benadryl and wait. I mean, they, they do everything, and that's why this research that Tom Casale and Amber Pepper are doing about sublingual and nasal, we're hoping might overcome people's fear of using it. Another reason people won't use it is they think if they use epinephrine, they've got to go to the emergency room, or they've got to call 911. Well, if you used it early and it works very well, uh, there's good evidence you don't have to go to the emergency room. You can just, you, you, you just, you know, be cautious, don't go out and do any exercise, make sure you get well hydrated and wait, you don't have to go. Uh, Tom Cazale again wrote a nice editorial during COVID about from a food allergy perspective of do you always have to go to the emergency room if you give epinephrine. What about in airplanes? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do there? Well, uh, airplanes have epinephrine on board. They don't have epinephrine though in the airport. Uh, so if you're walking through the airport, they don't have epinephrine like they do the defibrillators, although one might argue it's about as common as, as ventricular fibrillation. But um, they are available in airplanes. Uh, and you, know, you should tell them, you know, be aware of that if you're on an airplane, you can get it. And most of the time it's peanut in the airplanes. Again, it comes back to that food issue. In the community setting, it's going to be mainly restaurants. Um, and again, it's the same cast of characters, peanuts, tree nuts, milk, seafood. Milk's going to be the children. Uh, so for internists, peanut, tree nuts, and seafood. Um, and, and maybe shellfish, or seafood would cover both shellfish and finfish. Um, and a lot of times this happens even though you've told people you're allergic to things. So keep in mind that that, that happens. Well, let's spend some time on this mast cell issue. Uh, we, we have about 15, 20 minutes left to talk about treatment in mast cells and, and tryptase. So we've been focusing on anaphylaxis. And I, I hope you've been left with the, the, the message is that the, the, the definition is confusing because we can't always agree. There is no test. It's a clinical diagnosis. If I say you have anaphylaxis, you can't prove I'm wrong. But the one test that comes up is, will a tryptase prove or disprove whether this is anaphylaxis? Well, tryptase goes up if you have mast cell activation. It can go up if mast cells are activated by IgE, or it can go up if mast cells are activated by other mechanisms. So it becomes a marker of mast cell degranulation. And the cutoffs that have been developed are statistical cutoffs, just based upon probabilities. And so that if your mass, if your tryptase, your baseline tryptase in your blood, when you're perfectly happy walking around feeling fine, is above 20, we worry more that you may have systemic mastocytosis, a condition in which the mast cells are growing um, exceptionally more than they should. They have abnormal morphology. It's associated with both mast cell leukemias and bone marrow involvement and, and more severe things, although you can have indolent mastocytosis with low levels of these atypical mast cells in your bone marrow. But the point is, you're prone to anaphylaxis because you have too many mast cells. Now, during activation, the tryptase will go up, but at baseline, it will be elevated if you have a mast cell condition. There's now a group of people that have a mass tryptase above 11.5, and some would say 8.5. And they have either mast cells that are trigger happy, and they kind of degranulate spontaneously too often, or they have too many mast cells, but they don't have mastocytosis, or they have duplications of the tryptase gene. All three of those are possible. The most likely, though, is duplications of the tryptase gene. And so in population studies, if you look at serum tryptases, they, the most common explanation for an elevation above 11 but less than 20 is duplication of the tryptase gene. Well, some of those people have anaphylaxis more commonly, but some don't. We don't understand why there's a high variability in this, but it certainly happens. Increases in the tryptase above baseline is how we recognize degranulation events. So in your patient in the emergency room, you'll need to compare the tryptase done at the time of the event to the tryptase at baseline to determine if it's elevated. But if the, if the tryptase in the emergency room is 15, you already know it's above 11.5. So something's fishy. So you just need to know what their baseline is to see what category you want to put them into. There are some all different kinds of scores that have been developed. This one's from Spain, which helps to determine whether you should do a bone marrow exam or not to determine if the patient has mastocytosis. Because typically, the only way you can make systemic mastocytosis di diagnosis is a bone marrow. 
Now you can use skin and develop, and you would diagnose cutaneous mastocytosis, but to have systemic mastocytosis, you need involvement of an organ other than the skin. So the, the skin only would not be sufficient to say that systemic mastocytosis. So as you can see, if you're a male, if you have the absence of urticaria, urticaria is probably the most common manifestation of anaphylaxis, but in mast cell disorders with an anaphylaxis, they, they more commonly don't have urticaria. But that is a question you're gonna ask the nurse, is what color is the patient's skin after you gave them the injection? Because you assume they don't have a mast cell disorder, they're having a reaction to the drug you just gave them. And if their skin is red and itchy, that's, an, that's, that's anaphylaxis or a systemic allergic reaction. If it's wet and cold, that sounds more like vasovagal or they're in intractable shock. Presyncope and syncope are very, much more common with mast cell disorders. And here you can see the baseline tryptase, they have 15, less than 15, and greater than 25 in their scoring system. And if you have, um, um, if you have two or more, they're, they're suggesting you should consider doing a bone marrow. So these are scoring criteria. And mast cell diseases have scoring criteria too. As you, that you might need to know this for boards, but I don't know, but they have markers like CD2 and CD25 that you would look on the mast cells. They're supposed to be clusters of 15 or more. 25% um, are supposed to be spindle shaped, but the D816V mutation in KIT is the one that I would want you to know them, particularly know why. KIT is a tyrosine kinase. KIT is a receptor for the growth factor for mast cells. If you have a substitution of tryptophan D for valine, and then it's valine is substituted at the position 816 on the, on the, on the KIT, the tyrosine kinase on the mast cell, it auto activates and the mast cells grow without much stimulation. And there's now tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are being used to treat mast cell disorders that suppress KIT, and that could potentially be used in mast cell activation disorders who don't have mastocytosis. The studies to date have focused on mast mastocytosis and have shown that if you give the, this specific inhibitor of KIT, tyrosine kinase, you can blunt the mast cell growth and improve the patient with mastocytosis. Well, what about all those people with that have mast cell activation or familial hypertryptacemia who are having anaphylaxis? Would it help those people? We don't know, but I think it does. It, it, apritinib is, is being looked at in those populations. We talked about the baseline. Increase in tryptase is 1.2 plus 2, 1.2 the baseline plus 2, or 1.3 or 1.374, or 1.685. You can see well, all these different numbers. Well, these are sort of misspelled baseline too, I noticed. These are different numbers based upon high probability, low probability, the original criteria, or different, different people's looking at the problem. The bottom line is the tryptase should go up during active symptoms if it's mast cell mediated. And you, should have, you need a baseline to compare it to. And, and, and there's different cutoffs, so just, be, just know that. Uh, also keep in mind, tryptase does not prove anaphylaxis, nor does the absence of tryptase prove you didn't have anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a syndrome. Remember, it may not even always be mast cells. In that case, the tryptase may not be that reliable. So you cannot conclude, because the tryptase did not go up, my patient did not have anaphylaxis. I can conclude there was no mast cell activation that I could prove, but I can't prove it wasn't anaphylaxis. What are some other causes? The familial hereditary hypertryptacemia is what I was talking about. That's duplications of the tryptase gene. Mast cell activation we've already talked about, but the bottom ones are the ones I wanted to emphasize. Myeloid neoplasms, polycythemia, renal failure, hyperacidophilic syndromes will result in elevated tryptase even though it's not primarily a mast cell disorder. So keep in mind that tryptase is cute, interesting, very useful. We all want to be thinking about it, but it isn't a the definitive way you diagnose this. It's a syndrome, and then and the and the practice parameter is going to have this these these sort of num this uh, algorithm, and you can see their baseline serum tryptase. That's what BST stands for. Is eight. So remember we talked about 11.5 and 15 and 20 and 25, and they're saying eight. So if it's if it's a eight or above. They're suggesting that you might want to consider doing genetic testing for hypertryptacemia because that's going to increase your patient's risk of anaphylaxis. And, and you can see then you also have to decide whether I'm going to do a bone marrow examination based upon how, all these things. So 
the triptase becomes a useful thing you can use in clinic to kind of tell you whether you're in the in, in the area where you should be worrying about. It. And so the number, I think, in boards is going to be all over the place because no one's quite agreed on everything. So I think 11.5 is the one I would remember. But just keep in mind, 8 might be the one that eventually falls out on this. But 20 is sort of the cutoff for mastocytosis. But remember, in that Spanish criteria, they use 25. And red flags would be anything that makes you suspicious of something bad. Uh, lymph nodes, big spleen, uh, eosinophilia, there you're going to be doing a bone marrow. But so uh, that's, you know. And this is just another scoring system. I don't think we need to worry about that. So that's enough of mast, uh, mastocytosis and mast cell diseases. What about anaphylaxis in general? What's the most common explanation, uh, presentation? Urticaria, 90%. Now, keep in mind what I just said. Mast cell disorder patients sometimes don't have urticaria. And patients who have very rapid onset of severe hypotension, like in, in the OR, don't often, always get urticaria. So just keep that in mind, too. Airway involvement's the next. Again, that's how people die. They don't die from urticaria. No one itches to death. You could die from angioedema, though, if it's of the larynx, not of the tongue or the lip, but of the larynx. Cardiovascular is 50%, and then gastrointestinal is close behind. But again, that's miserable, but you don't usually, there's no, usually deaths. You can have uh, sometimes abdominal, misspelled abdominal, that's terrible. Uh, you can have uh, um, vomiting that's due to um, transient obstruction, GI obstruction, but it, it, it will resolve within time. And so an NG2 may be all you'll need, but it, it will get better. But it might make you worry about um, a, a small bowel obstruction. What about biphasic anaphylaxis? I have the person in the emergency room. I used the timing. I've treated you. You responded. Do I have to keep you overnight? Well, there's a there is a condition called biphasic anaphylaxis. It's hard to say how often it occurs. Maybe 5% of the time. I think it depends on how, how, what your criteria for anaphylaxis is. Um, but there are some, there is evidence to help you notice whether to keep the patient overnight. And, and the, the reasons would be a more severe presentation, multiple epinephrine doses, uh, a wider pulse pressure, uh, that is a lower diastolic um, pressure on presentation, uh, a drug trigger in children, someone who presents with anaphylaxis with no known trigger. And here they say actually the presence of cutaneous signs make it more likely that they may have biphasic and odds ratio is 2.5. Um, just keep in mind though, if you have to give multiple doses of epinephrine, you might want to keep the patient overnight for observation. However, if they respond very nicely to uh, epinephrine with one dose or even more than one dose, uh, and they have fairly good access to care and you think they can get an epinephrine auto injector and know how to use it, it's not unreasonable to discharge them and, and they can then self-administer epinephrine if biphasic anaphylaxis occurs. Biphasic anaphylaxis means anaphylaxis reoccurs without re-exposure to the antigen. It typically occurs four to eight hours after the initial event. Uh, it can be as severe and even more severe than the initial event, although it's not, that's not been my experience. It's usually about the same or less, but it can be more severe. And this is the argument for why patients need to be observed for a period after they recover. Um, what about, could I give them some other medicines and prevent biphasic anaphylaxis? And the answer is no. H1 antagonists, H2 antagonists, and corticosteroids do not reduce in adults the occurrence of biphasic anaphylaxis. We use it all the time in acute settings. It, it hasn't really, there's no role for H1 inhibitors and corticosteroids in preventing fatality from anaphylaxis. Uh, they, they do reduce itching. Uh, and, and we used to think they would help reduce late phase or biphasic anaphylaxis, but in adults, no. In children, maybe, but not in adults. What else do we have to think about? Uh, well, you got to be a doctor. Um, I mean, none of this is easy or it wouldn't have been fun to go to medical school, right? I mean, there's a wide differential. And you're going to see a lot more panic disorder and vocal cord dysfunction than you are going to see anaphylaxis, um, especially in, in, a, in a, a setting such as an emergency room. Globus and panic and vocal cord dysfunction occur a lot because people have been told they can die from anaphylaxis. Uh, they know they're food allergic. Uh, they think they ate it. They smelled it. Uh, they're having a panic attack, uh, and they're going on and on, but their voice sounds normal. My throat's tight, I can't breathe, and yet they're talking normally. That person does not have angioedema of the larynx. Their voice is going to change. And I see this often, they had to be intubated for airway protection. 
but I know it's a struggle. How do I know? How can I tell? It's, I'm struggling with this. So you, sometimes you have to do it. But keep in mind, if, if they're not working to breathe, if they don't have a paradoxical pulse of more than 10 millimeters and their voice is normal, I don't think that person has edema of their larynx. But, you know, it's fatal. You can't, you can't guess wrong. So I totally understand why it sometimes is a challenge. Keep carcinoid in mind. Carcinoid patients will flush. Uh, they can develop a very similar syndrome. Typically, the blood pressure doesn't go down. It goes up. So be aware of that. Uh, remember menopause because people flush. But also remember that menopause, I mean, menstrual cycles and hormone changes can affect uh, reactivity for, for, um, for, for, for anaphylaxis. So, you know, you, you've got to keep those things in mind. The tryptase peaks typically with one half hour to one and a half hours after the event. So you still want to draw it even after it's later, but keep in mind your accuracy is going down. Remember, you're looking at those formulas of 1.2 plus 2 or 1.3 or 1.685. That's based upon the peak. Uh, and of course, you don't know if you got the peak because you don't know what time this thing started. But you still want to get a value, even though you won't get the results back for a week and a half. It will still help you determine in retrospect whether this was anaphylaxis. So just keep in mind, it stays elevated for several hours after the event. And there have been studies looking at people who, who died from cardiovascular, uh, like in, in the OR, does the trip taste go up? And typically it doesn't go up. Um, and uh, after death, it will go up. But during resuscitation, it typically does not. So uh, shock itself does not elevate uh, trip taste typically. Well, what can I do if my patient, if, I'm, if, if timing is everything and I, I've got a great punchline, what else do I need to do? Well, the first thing is to have your patient lie down. Sometimes they don't want to. They feel anxious a bit. They're uncomfortable. They often feel warm. Uh, they're, they're a bit itchy, but you want them to be supine. Why is that? Well, they're vasodilating, and they're starting to lose vascular volume. So you want their feet elevated. You want that venous return to be maximized during the early phase. And then you want to give epinephrine. Well, what if they're on a beta blocker? What do I put down as my treatment of choice, or what do I prescribe? you give them epinephrine. You do not give them glucagon first, you give them epinephrine. I, I, H1 inhibitors have no role in the treatment of anaphylaxis other than they will make you feel better and make the patient feel more relaxed as they die. And they won't itch while they die, but they're still gonna die because H1 inhibitors do not affect the causes of death, bronchospasm, edema of the larynx, and shock. Uh, they might help edema of the airway slightly but they wouldn't help it enough to make a difference. Epinephrine would help the edema. It won't reverse what's there, but it prevents it from progressing. But the next thing you wanna give your patient that's critical is IV fluid. They need a lot of fluid. Why? Their third space losing it. And they're vasodilated. They need big time fluid. H2 inhibitors, not so much data. Nebulized beta agonists make a lot of sense if your patient's having chest tightness, and it wouldn't hurt if you've got some edema of the larynx. If you have racemic epinephrine, nobody has it around, but albuterol probably won't help that very much. But I think give them the nebulized beta agonist, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this was a, a survey from uh, an ER physician in the UK who noted in, in, in 10 patients who died outside the hospital, 40% of four of them occurred when patients sat up after they'd been upright, I mean, had been lying down or, or sitting. And again, it gets back to that fact their third space losing, you got to keep that venous return high as much as you can. I've, I've, I've made a lot of statements about epinephrine and giving epinephrine. Well, can I give too much epinephrine? Absolutely. It has a very narrow therapeutic window. It's very safe when given at the dose we give for anaphylaxis, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. But if you're given one milligram, 1.5 milligram total, you're probably now getting more adverse events than you are getting benefit because you've missed the opportunity to vasoconstrict before third space loss occurred. So keep in mind, you don't just keep giving epinephrine if it's not working. So what else, I mean, and this is the dose. Uh, I think if you're not sure the patient's having anaphylaxis, I would give 0.1. There's very little evidence that the dose of, of epinephrine makes a difference. Nobody's ever done dose ranging studies to prove that it should be 0.3 or 0.5 or whatever you wanna pick. What has been done is delay in epinephrine is what's been associated with death. Not the dose, but delay. So if you're not sure, give smaller doses, but still give it so that you knew that you, so you can document. I gave epinephrine five minutes after they got there, but I gave 0.1 because they seemed very anxious and I wasn't quite sure whether they had anaphylaxis or not. 
We prefer the lateral thigh because it's IM. It comes in a lot of different devices like this, which are all very expensive and scare patients. Not only the cost, but sometimes the, the idea scares patients. So you have to make sure they're comfortable with using them. But what else can you do as a doctor? Well, you can give dopamine. That's why, what I would next start for the, for the shock. You might consider glucagon if they're on a beta blocker. There's well-described case reports of people that are on beta blockers because glucagon elevates cyclic AMP in the mast cell and decreases further degranulation. And the dose is there, one to five milligrams. And I've used it once in my lifetime of many years and they threw up and they always throw up. So you make sure you've got the airway secure before you give it. So you do a, a low dose push of one, one to five milligrams and then you over five minutes and then you start a drip. Steroids don't really have much role to play, and you've already seen that it didn't really affect late phase outcomes or biphasic anaphylaxis either, but almost everybody gives them, so go ahead and give it. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to give. I just don't think it's going to make a difference. Methylene blue is interesting. Um, methylene blue is, uh, is, is discussed in OR settings where intractable shock occurs, and it's been described in... in um, in emergency departments too, when people have presented with intractable shock, and, the, and it's felt to work by blocking nitric oxide synthase, or it does. It actually blocks um, a, a, a G-coupled, uh, uh, guanosine-coupled enzyme that is a nitric oxide synthase, uh, and if you block nitric oxide formation, you block vasodilation. And this is found to be, have been found to be very effective in intractable shock uh, with, with anaphylaxis and even in sepsis. Um, and it's very safe. Uh, so I think uh, if you have someone who's on a, a beta blocker and um, uh, ACE inhibitor, I, I would consider using methylene blue. It's not really mentioned in any of the guidelines. Uh, the Europeans put it in their guidelines. Um, it's just kind of it's a, it's a footnote in the U.S. more, but uh, I, there's a lot of very good literature supporting it, and it's very safe. Uh, so if you have access to it, you might want to consider infusing methylene blue one to two milligrams per kilo over 20 minutes, followed by a drip. Our patient, by the way, uh, she did get epinephrine, um, and uh, she she only had this. Blood pressure is 100 over 60. She so wasn't below the, the, the line. Her pulse was 88. Her skin, though, was warm, but she had some itching, but she didn't have any hives. We gave her epinephrine, 0. 0.1. We then gave her 0. 0.3. We then gave her 0. 0.3 again, and she ended up in the emergency room. However, she lived. And I felt like we did everything possible. We did start an IV, and uh, and and she she lived, and she wanted to stay on the allergy injections. It's interesting. After having an event like this, we're treating uh, rhinitis with a life-threatening treatment when rhinitis is not life-threatening. That's part of the reason I think we as allergists have such a low threshold for not for wanting to treat because we know what we're dealing with and our risk. So in conclusion, anaphylaxis is not rare. But fortunately, fatality is rare. You remember, about the same as maybe a lightning strike in Tampa. That's if you're food allergic. Now, a random person, you know, it's going to be even much less. And anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis. There is no test that I can prove or disprove it. It has a broad differential. And there's a lot more anxiety out there than there is anaphylaxis. But by golly, you better not miss that one with anaphylaxis while you're treating all those people with anxiety. Systemic allergic or allergic-like reactions may progress to anaphylaxis. So you don't have to wait for shock to give epinephrine. Give it early in the process. Remember that vasodilation is starting, that third space loss is starting. Treat it early. Don't get hung up in the terminology. And don't feel like just because I gave epinephrine, I have to call this anaphylaxis. You don't. Timely epinephrine treats systemic allergic reactions and early anaphylaxis, and it's less effective later in the, co in the course of events. So, and don't base the fact that they got better, that doesn't prove they had anaphylaxis. It sort of supports your point that you think it was going that way, but it doesn't prove it. Early onset of symptoms, bad sign. Injections, bad sign. You're giving biologics frequently in clinic in almost all specialties, even at home. Biologics are large molecules, 150,000 Daltons typically. They're very potentially going to be antigens, and they could cause anaphylaxis. Triptase is important. Remember to always get one, if you can, during the acute event, and to compare it to the baseline. Absence of skin symptoms is a good indicator, typically, that this is not likely anaphylaxis, except in the most severe cases and in mast cell disorders. 
as a wise professor, I will close and give you some references that we'll have out for you. So any questions in the chat um, for us today? So Dr. O'Neill has asked, has how asked. concerned should we be for patients, RE biphasic anaphylaxis? Are the onset and severity of initial uh, SXS? Sorry, I don't know what that is. Symptoms. <laughs> Symptoms, sorry. Yeah, that's great, that's a great severity question. severity reaction in delayed phase or independent clock resets? In, independent what? Clock resets. Clock resets. I'm not sure what, but that might. Because I mean, Can but let's go back about. That? No, I don't see. I, I I don't know how to turn on my my chat. But let's not. I don't want to play with that. I, I'll mess up something. Yeah. Um, but let's just talk about. I want to go back and go over that biphasic because that's a very good question because it does come up frequently when we have patients in clinic, or in uh, the OR in the emergency department about how long do I need to observe them. Uh, so, so I, I, uh, I meant to emphasize that maybe a little more clearly that the things that correlate with biphasic responses, biphasic anaphylaxis, meaning a recurrence of anaphylaxis after the initial episode goes over, is multiple doses of epinephrine. So if your patient had to get more than two or three doses, three particularly, I would probably favor keeping them for at least 12 hours to watch. If they respond to one or two doses and they responded very nicely, I don't think you need to keep them. If it's drug related, a medication caused anaphylaxis is probably a little more risky. And if, and if it's uh, idiopathic, meaning it occurred without any apparent cause, no identified cause, it might be a little more risky. So I think those things would be the ones and, and severity. If, if it's more severe, it's more likely to have a biphasic. But if it's more severe, you're going to get more doses of epinephrine. So that those two are, are you know, are related to one another. So I think those are the ones I would go by. Severity, number of doses of anaphylaxis, um, epinephrine. Is it drug related or is it idiopathic? Those would be the ones that would make me want to keep the patient at least 12 hours. Four to eight is typically the range. But so I, overnight should be sufficient to rule out biphasic anaphylaxis. There have been some rare reports, uh, 24 hours and 36 hours. I mean, you're going to find some of these outliers, but from the standard of care, if you give the person their, their own epinephrine, you could let them go anyway, as long as they get it. The problem is in the middle of the night, pharmacy's closed, the copay's too high, I don't want to get it, I don't know exactly how to use it. That's what you're dealing with in the middle of the night. This is a question from Dr. Lozano. Uh, biphasic anaphylaxis, in my reading, I have found it may or may not be related to late administration of epinephrine to the initial episode. What is your opinion? Yeah. Well, that's right, uh, because severity is correlated with late administration of epinephrine. So delayed initial epinephrine is increases your risk of biphasic because it increases your risk of severe reaction. So again, it's indirectly linked. So uh, I agree with that, that delay in the initial epinephrine probably increases your risk of biphasic. But keep in mind, this isn't really hard evidence. It's kind of based upon, you know, the best you can dredge it through all the looking at the literature. So again, if we think about biphasic, severe onset, delay in ep epinephrine is another good point, but multiple doses of epinephrine, idiopathic cause, drug-induced cause. Those are the things that might make you more prone and or the presence of asthma because asthma is a risk factor. And, and then you had, well, what about cardiac disease? Well, that's a risk factor for anaphylaxis in general. So maybe someone with cardiac disease, I'd want to watch them for 12, 12 hours. Maybe if you're older, that's a, that's a risk factor for fatality. Maybe I should watch you for 12 hours. You know, if you're 25 or 65, that might influence whether I want to keep you overnight to watch you. Dr. Cardet says, great talk. In a severe case such as required mechanical ventilation for airway compromise. How long would you continue systemic corticosteroids? Well, we, we really don't have any data on corticosteroid doses uh, or duration uh, for anaphylaxis. And in general, I would emphasize that corticosteroids do not treat anaphylaxis. They, they might help ex, uh, accelerate resolution of wheezing and if the patient's asthmatic and uh, angioedema from third space loss in the airway 
So they might haste, you know, increase the, the speed of recovery, I guess you could say. But anaphylaxis is an acute event that's over within minutes to hours. Biphasic is going to occur within 8 to 12 hours. So I think with steroid therapy, you, most you need to think about is maybe 48 hours. And then I think at that point, you've done what you can do with, with corticosteroids. It's not going to be a prolonged recovery of two weeks. I mean, they, you don't need that. Now, an asthma attack that's due to anaphylaxis is typically an acute attack that's going to respond to acute therapy and not cause a prolonged anaphylax, I mean, asthma episode that goes on and on. So I don't believe you need to discharge patients with five days of prednisone after they've had angioedema of the airway. I mean, it, once the angioedema is going down, you're done. You're, you're, you're finished. You can stop it. Dr. Zahn has a comment. ER docs have a different definition of anaphylaxis. E ELI, I think maybe she means epi. Uh, epi early for throat sensation symptoms. Well, and I agree completely with the question of the, the observation that people differ in their definitions. I would want to make sure we emphasize that point that we all don't agree on what we want to call anaphylaxis. Um, throat symptoms in a person who's brought to the emergency room is almost, well, I shouldn't say almost never, is very seldom anaphylaxis. And the reason is if they have angioedema of the throat from, as a manifestation of anaphylaxis and they had to be brought to the emergency room, so much time has passed that they're going to have strider, they're going to have paradoxical pulse, they're going to have voice change, they're going to have a lot of manifestations of angioedema of the throat. People who complain of throat tightness after being brought to the emergency room after onset 45 minutes ago or an hour and a half ago, and, and they're talking away, saying about their throat feels funny and all that, I don't think they have angioedema of the throat. So whether you choose to call throat tightness anaphylaxis and give epinephrine or not, remember, it's, it's a syndrome. I, I can't prove it's not. And if you think it is, then use it. But if you've got an anxious person and you give them epinephrine, it typically makes their anxiety worse. And so it's a tricky thing when you're dealing with throat tightness. I, that, I, I don't have an answer. I just to say that uh, you're right. There, there's differences in clinical practice. Um, but as I told our, our team, um, medicine, we also said medicine is the, 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 the science of uncertainty and the art of probability. So we're always dealing with the fact that we can't be 100 percent sure we've got to hedge our bets the best we can. So I would say if you if you're not sure, give low doses of epinephrine, but give it early. Dr. Moapatra, uh, great talk as always. Are there any downsides to intranasal epinephrine? Well, intranasal is exciting because I think it might overcome the barrier of the needle that patients are so afraid of using. Um, and I, I, um, the studies to date have mainly focused on pharmacokinetic data showing that they can achieve the same blood levels using nasal ap the nasal applicator as they can with the injector. But we don't have enough clinical experience to say whether, you know, are there going to be other problems? I mean, I don't think so. Uh, it's going to open your nose up a little bit, which probably is not a bad thing. Um, you know, I think there's going to be concerns about doctors of being, is it, is it going to be as effective? I don't know if I can trust it. What if they, what if they sneeze right after they use it? Is that still going to work? Uh, you know, there are going to be some questions raised. And Dr. Casali has actually developed a protocol to look at some conditions like urticaria that epinephrine treats, idiopath, any kind of urticaria, typically epinephrine helps, um, that to try to sort of show that it's, it's effective. It's effective, it, not only just pharmacokinetic data, but it's actually effective. So to date, we don't have any side effects. Um, we're only talking about occasional use, not daily use. And so I don't think there's any big concerns that right now. Same is true of the sublingual. Uh, that will be more like a wafer or like a little, one of these melt things that you put in your mouth and you absorb the epinephrine from the mouth. Uh, and that also seems to be looking pretty pretty solid from pharmacokinetic data. But again, the question is going to be implementing it and getting it approved. But the nasal will be the first one available sometime later this year. And again, Dr. Catali's group helped get that um, approved. Nothing more in chat. Well, I appreciate it very much. I uh, hope I... Hope I didn't go over anyway, because it's four minutes after. But I'll let you guys get to clinic, and it's always it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. And someday I hope to see you face to face, nose to nose. You know, eye to eye. Take care. <laughs>